Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is the Lutheran Church that's at the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia. Our pastor is Reverend John H. Pollock. He's the pastor here. He'll be coming forward in a very short time and will be asking us to confess our sins before others as God commands us to do. We will confess our sins and then the pastor, who is really pastor, was ordained in the apostolic succession by a bishop in the apostolic succession. He will declare the forgiveness of our sins and he will invoke the apostolic succession all the way back to Jesus. And you can feel that your sins are really forgiven when the pastor, the pastor declares that your sins are forgiven. This is uh, the 10.30 a.m. service, St. John's Lutheran. We have two services every Sunday, the 8.30, 8 o'clock service and the 10.30 a.m. service. We also have Sunday school in between. Come to Sunday school and sing with us. Uh, Dr. Phil Kane is our piano player, wonderful piano player. So come and join, listen to him play the piano. Wednesday's midweek service is at 6 p.m. It's at uh, 6.30 p.m. and it is in the chapel. So come and receive Holy Communion once a week. This is a wonderful thing. You can receive communion, you can receive eternal life. How could you turn down the offer of eternal life? You can worship with us today. You can, be, you can ask Jesus to come into your heart. You can repent, you can believe, you can love God, you can love one another, and say this simple prayer, Jesus, come into my heart, you can be saved, you can have eternal life. What a wonderful offer. This hymn, Blessed Assurance, is written by Fanny Crosby. She was a blind lady and she's written many, many hymns. Blind hymn writer Fanny Crosby wrote in the 1900s, Blessed Assurance. This is following the theme today of the Beatitudes. You are blessed if you love one another. You're blessed if you love the poor. Jesus said that. You receive
achieve happiness. This is the way of happiness. Beatitudes means be happy.
Jim Jackson will now read the scripture. The first reading, the, all the theme today is the Beatitudes. Blessed are you. And this is a way of happiness. First reading for today is from the 17th chapter of Jeremiah. Thus says the Lord, Cursed are those who trust in mere morals and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. They shall be like a shrub in the desert, shall not see when relief comes. They shall live in the parched places of the wilderness in an uninhibited salt land. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is the Lord. They shall be like a tree planted by water, sending out its roots by the stream. Shall not fear when heat comes, and its leaves shall stay green. In the year of drought it is not anxious, and it does not cease to bear fruit. The heart is devious above all else, it is perverse. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart, to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. The word of the Lord. Thanks. That was not Kim Jackson. She was printed in the bulletin, but that's a mistake. And now, doing the psalm, we'll have the, uh, we're going to sing the psalm together. This is Psalm 1, the first psalm. believe in eternal life and that's we're celebrating this today we have eternal life you can have eternal life if you ask Jesus to come into your heart worship with us this is a wonderful thing offered to you eternal life listen to the gospel pastor John Pollock is reading the gospel the Beatitudes the Holy Gospel according to St. Luke the sixth chapter glory to you Jesus came down with the twelve, and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defend you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for surely your reward is great in heaven. 
for that is what their ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when I'll speak well of for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord. First of all, of course, a reminder once again of Ash Wednesday on March 6th, March 6th, beginning in the season of Lent, uh, and our Lent series on the Sermon on the Mount, which goes all the way through to Palm Sunday, Holy Week, and Easter. And the second announcement I have that I hate to give you, but it's for your benefit, March 10th, it would now be quarter to 12 instead of quarter to 11. March 10th, we lose our hour of sleep as we push our clients ahead of our hour instead of behind the hour. So be sure on March 9th, you set your clock back, or ahead of our hour, spring forward. So on Sunday morning, March 10th, you're here at the right time and not an hour late. And as I said, I hate to give you that news because I hate to turn my clock. Please give your attention now to the Lord. Give your attention to the choir. The anthem is directed by Vicki Perks, and Greg Nolte is our organist. Listen to our choir, the little choir that could.
Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. If I handed you a piece of paper and it had one sentence on it which said, hitting the jackpot means, and then there was a blank, you fill in the blank. How would you answer? Would you answer by saying, hitting the jackpot means financial security for the rest of my life? Or would you put hitting the jackpot means paying off all my bills and no longer having to put up with phone calls because I'm a day late in paying them? Or would you answer it by saying hitting the jackpot means I can go on those vacations I only dreamed of and I can buy that house that I always dreamed of and I can have four cars in the garage. Or, would you put hitting the jackpot means having a relationship with Jesus Christ? If we were to ask that question of a group of people, say at a ball game, or at a concert, or the symphony, <coughs> the opera, or the ballet, whatever kind of social event, I would imagine that the large percentage of the answers would come back with a material answer. It would deal with financing, taking vacations, buying houses, whatever That very few would give it a spiritual answer. Hitting the jackpot means a relationship with Jesus Christ. But in our gospel lesson today, Jesus is making a radical message or preaching a radical message. And in that message, he is telling us that hitting the jackpot means something we probably never stop to consider. So we turn back to that sixth chapter of the gospel of St. Luke. And we read and he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall live. The first thing we learn about hitting the jackpot is that hitting the jackpot means knowing Jesus Christ. I know that's not what the world would say. The world would be astonished by that. But when we look at what Jesus is saying, we realize that it is true. Hitting the jackpot is knowing Jesus. He tells us blessed. Here the word blessed does not mean necessarily favorable circumstances. <coughs> But it means ultimate well-being, which comes from sharing in salvation. It also means the satisfaction that comes from a right relationship with God. That is hitting the channel. Sharing in salvation. <laughs> having that right relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. So what this brings about is that we are blessed when we are poor. Now, as you read this in English, and you hear the word poor, I'm sure your mind immediately thinks of poverty. You think of those who live in the lower strata of the socioeconomic system. You're thinking of the poor in the third world who struggle daily just to find a morsel to eat. But as Jesus is giving these beatitudes, the word poor here has nothing to do with the physical. It has nothing to do with your station in society. It has nothing to do with whether or not you can buy a flat screen TV and have cable or direct TV. It doesn't have anything to do with whether or not you can buy the best cuts of meat and the best vegetables and so forth in the store, or if you have to buy the cheapest. 
The word translated as poor means spiritual poverty. Blessed are those in spiritual poverty who realize that they are nothing without God who solely depend on God. They are the blessed. They are the ones who have the plan of salvation. They are the ones who have their right relationship with God because they realize that the spiritual is far more important than the physical and the material. Blessed are those who have spiritual poverty, who realize they are nothing without God, who realize they must depend solely on God. And as followers of Jesus Christ, that is supposed to be our attitude. As followers of Jesus, we realize we are nothing without God. It doesn't matter what the world does, how many honors they pile on us, how much praise they pile upon us, how much power they give us, how much prestige they give us. That's nothing. Compared with that relationship of knowing Jesus Christ and realizing that without God we have no hope of salvation, and that we are dependent solely on God for that salvation and for the power of the Holy Spirit to enable us to continue our pilgrimage on earth. So we need the jackpot. There's knowing Jesus who tells us that we are to rely on Him, not ourselves, not the world. Hunger. Blessed are those who are hungry. Again, nothing to do with having an empty stomach. Nothing to do with having hunger pains. It's not talking about physical hunger. It's talking about spiritual. It's talking about blessed are those who crave to know righteousness. Who crave to want to be in the presence of God. But who also realize that they can do nothing to be in that presence of God, that it all comes through faith in Jesus Christ. That without Christ's death upon the cross, without His shedding His blood to pay the debt of sin that we owe, we can never have our spiritual hunger filled. So we are blessed in the fact that we crave for that righteousness. We, we are hungry to know God. We are hungry to know His Word. We are hungry to do His Word. That is hitting the jackpot. And then he says, blessed are those who weep. Again, we are not talking about those in grief over the loss of a loved one. I had a funeral Friday here in the church. I went to a funeral yesterday morning at first. Interacting with two families in grief over the loss of a loved one. But that is not what Jesus said is speaking of here. The word weep means to be broken hearted over sin and evil. Blessed are those who instead of think they're greater than everybody else and the wrongs they do don't matter because might makes right. Blessed are those who are broken hearted over their sin and over the evil in the world and turn to Jesus for that forgiveness of that sin and to help them face that evil in the world. So the first lesson of hit, hitting the jackpot means a relationship with Jesus Christ. Second lesson we learn from hitting the jackpot is that the jackpot is not material, but spiritual. Material is temporal. It does not last. It disappears. Yet over the past 30 years or so, we have seen a rise in lotteries, casinos, and off-track betting clubs. We have seen people flock to these, trying to get rich quick, trying to solve all their financial problems by hitting the right number drawing the right card, or betting on the right horse. There's all kinds of rich, quick schemes that people
people try to pull you into. And unfortunately, some people fall for those and they, at the end, they have less than they had before they entered into the scheme because it's all uh, corrupt. It's all a fix. And yet people continue to pour money into that, thinking that will make, they will make it. And once they win, they want more. When Ohio first started their lottery, long before Indiana or Kentucky developed, had a state lottery, some man in northern Kentucky, physician, an orthopedic surgeon, so you know he already was financially in pretty good shape, he won an Ohio lottery for $5 million. Two years later, a year later, a year from the day he won $5 million, he won $20 million in the Ohio lottery. When is enough enough? See, that's the problem with thinking the material is a jackpot. You just keep wanting more. We used to have a custodian here who was a good fella. He had a, a boss for another job he had when he wasn't a custodian. And this boss would take him to whatever the casino was that's closest. Um, before the one they built in Columbus and we're going to it since then. But they didn't go to Indiana. His boss one night sat there at the table playing blackjack, I think it was, won $40,000. Jackie and Ben, the same crummy 
pothole filled roads that we drove on 19 years ago are still the crummy pot filled hold roads that that casino money was supposed to repair. And unfortunately, little town of Griffin, 19,000 people, there have been numerous people, some who we knew, who have lost their homes, their families, and their jobs because they believe in materials hitting the job. They lost everything they own at the casino. Materialism is not real. You can't take it with you. As I've always said, until somebody proved me wrong the other day, you never see a U-Haul in behind the hearse. But I saw the internet some clown down in Texas or somewhere hooked a U-Haul into the hearse. But it doesn't matter whatever is in that U-Haul, wasn't going with it. But no, but you can't take it. You know, I've done funerals where people will put something special in the casket with the deceased. The past retired pastor of Hopeful Lutheran, who I succeeded, uh, when he passed away, his kids put his favorite fishing pole in the casket. You know, I've done funerals and people have put playing cards in the casket with the person and in their hand put the best Euchre hand you can have, or the best Texas Holder hand you can have, or whatever the uh, best hand you can have in poker. Um, see, you know, tell how to play poker, I don't know what it's called. Wherever you get the best card, no hand can beat it. They'll put that in your hand. I've seen people put Coca Cola in the casket with them. I've seen them put cans or bottles of beer in the casket. I've seen them put bottles of wine or gin bean. Dig that casket up, and that stuff's still there. Never want to see. 
see her when she started declining. It never came hardly to see his dad when he lived with our grandmother, because he'd been burned. He contested the will. And by the time it was done, and when, when it started, my mom you know, had, had to get a lawyer. She goes, the lawyer, and the lawyer said, Patty said, I'm telling you right now, said, the only person who's going to make any money off this are we lawyers. He said, the best thing is to convince your nephew to drop it. Well, he wouldn't. So nobody in the family got anything for everyone in the family. We didn't even get any of the things from her house. Because the judge ordered her house and all its contents put up for sale. So we didn't get, get to take any of china or silver, the trophies her horses had won in the running races, pictures she had, books that she wanted me to have that she had bought specifically with me in mind because they were of a theological or had something to do with the Christian faith. All that was sold to strangers. Because our cousin thought the material was more important than the spirit. When John D. Rockefeller passed away, at that time, one of the richest men in the world, not the richest man in the world, there was a reporter who was just obsessed with knowing how much money Rockefeller left behind. So he made an appointment to meet with Rockefeller's top aide some weeks after the funeral. So the day of the appointment came, the reporter went up and he was ushered into the aide's office and he asked the aide, he said, sir, can you tell me how much did Rockefeller leave behind? The aide looked at him and simply said, all of it. That's what it was. He leave it all behind. And he may not even know how much it was. So hitting the jackpot is knowing Jesus. Because Jesus promises us he will be with us always. You know the old story. Maybe you experienced it or not. You've seen it happen. When you're popular and wealthy, you have all kinds of friends. You know, you hear people talk about all the time when lotteries said they suddenly had these cousins come out of work, work they never knew they had, never knew they were part of the family. Once you go dead, same thing with you know, popularity of athletes and rock and roll singers and all that, country singers, and when they're on top, everybody's their buddy, everybody knows them, everybody wants to be with them. But once their career starts to climb, what happened to everybody? Where are all those people? You can't get your calls from them. Jesus promises always to be with us. Jesus promises us that he has gone to prepare a place for us. Jesus tells us that we have eternal life by believing in Him. Not because of anything we've done. Remember, we are solely dependent on God. We have the promise of eternal life because of the cross. Because Jesus willingly died on that cross, paying the debt of sin that we have. Some years ago, it was really popular for some reason within the, the church to always talk about baptism. No matter the sermon, talk about baptism. All those emphasis on baptism. Well, baptism is great. We're baptized, God accepts us as his child. But if you don't have the cross, you don't have any baptism. <laughs> if you don't have Jesus hanging on the cross, there's no empty tomb. If you don't have Jesus on the cross, there's no resurrection. So why would you emphasize baptism, which is a result of the cross, instead of doing what St. Paul tells us, is that we preach Jesus Christ crucified. That is the ladder to heaven. That is the key that unlocks heaven's door, the cross. And so before you talk about baptism, you have to talk about the and that is why Jesus can promise us that he is hitting the jackpot. That is why he can promise us that he's always with us 
that has prepared a place for us and that he is coming again. So the question is, have you hit the jackpot? Do you have that relationship with Jesus Christ? Is Jesus your Lord and Savior? Or do you think somebody else or something else can help you with salvation? You have hit the jackpot if you realize that the jackpot is not material, but spiritual. It's not things, but your relationship with God and Jesus Christ. You have hit the jackpot if you are looking forward for that place prepared for you by Jesus Christ himself. You have hit the jackpot if you're a child of the Heavenly Father through your faith in Jesus Christ. This truth is hitting the jackpot. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding in your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now sing Jesus, the very thought of you, hymn number 754, in the back of the worship. Hymn number 754. Jesus, the very thought of you was a 12th century hymn written by Bernard of Clairvaux. He was a monk who lived in France, a Frenchman. Jesus, the very thought of you. 12th century hymn written by Bernard of Clairvaux. Bernard lived 1050 to 11, 1090 to 1153. Martin Luther called Bernard the best monk that ever lived. I admire him above all the rest put together. He started many monasteries. He was in Dijon, France. He wrote this hymn, 12th century hymn, Bernard of Clairvaux, who lived 1090 to 1153. Today is February the 17th, 2019, sixth Sunday after the Epiphany.
So do we come this day with the concerns of our hearts and our prayers on behalf of all as they have been? <coughs> our response today is hear our prayer. Blessed Father of Lord Jesus Christ, you have delivered your people through the blood of your Son and have given us the new birth into a hope and life death cannot overcome. Grant to your church honesty in our preaching and love in our service to those who have not yet heard the gospel. Lord, in your mercy. Blessed Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have given us your pledge of promise that we shall not be alone. Guard your people against the threats of the enemy and the persecution of the world still against you. Deliver all pastors, teachers, missionaries, deacons, and other church workers from all that would hinder their service to us on your behalf, and bestow upon them your spirit and his gifts for their faithful work. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you sent your Son that we might have healing through his wounds. Be with the sick, the hospitalized, the aged, the infirm, the dying, and the troubled in mind and heart. Let them help them to know your presence and your peace in their afflictions, and grant them healing and relief as you will. Teach them contentment of heart and keep them in faith till the day of Christ's coming. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Blessed Father, our brother Jesus Christ. <clears throat> We are the blessed and chosen people of your grace and favor. You have called us by your word and gathered us by your spirit before this altar. Grant to us repentance and faith that we may receive the sacrament for our benefit and so be transformed by this blessed communion and be made more Christ-like in faith and service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Blessed Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, though now we weep in the face of death, we rejoice to know the power of Christ and his resurrection. In this hope, we commend to you all the faithful who have died in your faith and fear. Bring us to those who have fallen asleep in Christ, that <clears throat> to that blessed day when the dead shall be raised, when sin shall no more accuse, when death shall no more grieve, and we will, when we will live in your presence evermore. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things, blessed Father, and those things you know we need, we pray you to grant us for the sake of and because of the merits of Jesus Christ alone, with whom you live and reign, the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now time for our offering. Our ushers are Helen Wallace and Janet Hogue. They'll be coming forward now, receiving the offering plates and passing the offering plates to the members of the congregation as they give their gifts to God, to the church. We are called to give, to tithe, to give 10% of all we make to God. And certainly that's a, a, not difficult because 90% is left to us. We don't think about material things though. We think about the blessedness of living a Christian life. If you're happy and you know it, you are a Christian. To live a Christian life, Jesus says the way to be happy is to follow the Beatitudes. He gives the Sermon on the Plain. He gives a plain version of the Beatitudes. Before this, he gave the Sermon on the Mount, and he gave a more complicated version of the Beatitudes. The second sermon that he preached is the Sermon on the Plain. And there's a condensation of the Beatitudes, talking about how we're blessed, we, how to be happy. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. If you're happy and you know it, your life will surely show it. We are having a lesson today on the Beatitudes. Our pastor has preached this lesson about you hit the jackpot when you take Jesus into your life, when you ask him to be the Lord of your life. All you have to do to receive happiness is to ask Jesus to come into your life and he will do it. You love God, you love your neighbor as yourself, you repent, you believe, you do those things, then you can receive eternal happiness, eternal life. What a wonderful offer. Eternal happiness and eternal life. The happiness now in our life.
flowers on the chancel stands are given to the glory of God and presented by Linda Anderson in memory of Terry Anderson's birthday today. By Cindy Pearson in memory of Barb DeSellum on her birthday in honor of Les Pearson and Mindy Pearson on their birthdays. Lots of birthdays today. Gina Pollock and family in honor of Pastor Pollock's birthday and Pastor and Gina in honor of Aaron Pollock's birthday. Think of all these birthdays and all these flowers are given in honor of all these birthdays. Terry Anderson, Barb DeSellum, <coughs> Les Pearson, Mindy Pearson, Gina Pollock, Pastor Pollock, Aaron Pollock. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you have blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us and what we have gathered in feeding the world with your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. St. John practices an open communion. For all those who are baptized and believe in Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior, we believe his body and blood are truly present as we gather his table in our communion age. In your own individual congregation, we invite and encourage to come forward with us this morning as we gather at the table of the Lord. Also this morning, we are going to be in the Green Sunday do this, we are going to go from the great thanksgiving directly to the Eucharistic prayer, from the Eucharistic prayer to the Lord's prayer, leaving out the preface, the Sanctus, or Holy, 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 and the Anus Day, like of God. So, we we'll only really need the hymnal for the great thanksgiving and the follow the Eucharistic prayer. The Lord be with you.
Mighty the Lord Jesus Christ, in his precious blood, strengthen, preserve you in true faith and the life eternal. written in 1855 by a minister named 
Joseph M. Scriven, S-C-R-I-V-E-N. He was a Canadian minister. He'd had a tragic life. He lost two women who he was engaged to. His fiance was pulled from a lake, drowned in front of him. When he was dying, he became, uh, became, he had a high fever and he fell critically ill. In his delirium, he fell into a lake and was drowned. He then was buried with his fiance at a large grave. It was arranged so his feet were opposite those of his lost love, Eliza, and that his resurrection they may arise facing one another. This hymn was written by Joseph M. Scriven, what a friend we have in Jesus, who led a tragic life, but a poetic gift, wrote this wonderful hymn, what a friend we have in Jesus. We're happy when we know it, because Jesus is our friend. Church, Springfield, Ohio. This is February the 17th, 2019. This is the sixth Sunday after the Epiphany. St. John's is located at the corner of Wittenberg and Columbia, and we thank you for worshiping with us today. You have seen how you can receive Jesus Christ and you can be happy. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. The pastor has talked about how you can hit the jackpot. You can obey Jesus Christ as he said in his sermon, you can be happy. Blessed are you if you do as he says and lead the Christian life and you can be happy in your life. Also you can receive eternal life. What a wonderful gift is offered to you. You can receive happiness in your life and you can receive eternal life. Come here and worship with us. Learn what Jesus has to say. Read Jesus. Take Jesus into your heart. Make him Lord of your life. Receive him in Holy Communion and go as you are filled with Jesus throughout the week. Go and do as he asks to love God and love one another. This last hymn was written by Joseph Scriven, and he was a minister in Canada. I told you that this was, what a friend we have in Jesus. Joseph wrote this hymn because he led such a sad life, and this gave comfort to him. He lost his fiance, she was drowned, and when he was dying himself, he had a high fever, and he stumbled into a lake and drowned in a lake. He drowned just like his fiance. They were buried feet to feet in Canada, so that on the resurrection, the two could meet one another in the resurrection and stand together. 
This hymn was written, What a Friend We Have in Jesus, written by Joseph Scriven, a Canadian minister, was known for all the good works he did, but for the sad life that he lived. He was, had a poetic gift, wrote this poem, and he had a tragic death, but he has the resurrection just as Jesus promised, eternal life. Come and worship with us anytime here at St. John's Lutheran Church, 10.30 a.m. This, this, I'm sorry, this is a uh, 10.30 service every Sunday, and uh, Holy Communion is celebrated the first and third Sunday of each month, festivals and every Wednesday evening. We are celebrating Holy Communion today, receive the body and blood of Jesus Christ. What a wonderful offer, what a wonderful gift. We'll see you next week. Tune in uh, on any time to YouTube and watch our service. You can receive Jesus Christ. You can ask him to come into your heart. And during this service, you can pray that prayer. Jesus, come into my heart. I make you Lord of my life. I repent. I believe. I love God. I love others. I'm doing what you ask. I'm leading a Christian life and I receive eternal life.